So final preparations. In this chapter, we'll perform a few additional tasks to prepare for building the temporary system. We'll create a set of directories in LFS, add an unprivileged user, and explain the units of time SBUs to measure how long it takes to build the packages. So we would need to create a default layout. So this is the start of the building of the actual Linux from scratch system. So if we look at the layout at the moment, all we've got is the, well, the default lost and found directory that gets created. When you uh, create the file system, an EXT file system, and the sources directory we've just created and downloaded all the packages in, these commands here will start to create some of the more recognizable um, directories. As you can see, we've got an etc, a user, and a var directory there now with some subdirectories off of those as well. Um, and that's what the remainder of these commands do. So when putting these commands in, it's better to do one at a time, just so that you can execute that one command and observe any errors or output that may come at the end of that command. If you just copy everything in these grey boxes, you might be doing several commands at once and saving a bit of time, but there's a very good chance you may miss an error or some message that's important um, as it scrolls off the screen. So we've created a tools directory here to keep some of the temporary programs that we're going to be creating. Um, and those programs are temporary because we'll be using those tools to create the final system. So next we're going to add an LFS user and the reason for this is that the initial build of the temporary tools needs to be done in the host system and it will be risky to build these as the root in case we affect the host system in some way. So we'll add the LFS group and then add the LFS user and it will use that LFS group as well. Uh, there's explanations there about that command. As there is with every command in Linux from scratch, there's always an explanation. Set a password for LFS so we can log in as it. And then grant LFS full access to all the directories under LFS, making LFS the owner. So we do that, and that command there. And it says some host systems, the following SU command does not complete properly. Um, I have had this happen on the odd occasion with some other distributions. As it says there, I, this is what I found, that the FG command will fix the issue. For some reason, the command runs and then sits in the background. And as I'd expect, Gen 2 doesn't behave like that. So again, it's another reason why I recommend Gen 2 as a host. Um, so yeah, we've um, become the LFS user now. So we're going to set up an environment for the LF user, a build environment. So we create a profile setting, a profile file, and a bash RC file with some settings in it. And again, all these settings are explained here, what they do, what their purposes are. And it says several commercial distributions add an un undocumented instantiation of etc bash dot bash RC to the initialization of bash and it can affect the environment. So you don't need to do this for Gen 2, but I'll run it because it will prove a point. If there are any changes that need to be done, and I need to do this as a root user as well. So I'll just come back out, paste that in. If there are any changes, because the uh, this move command has got the V option, it will show you what it's moving. So by running this as a root on Gen 2, you can see there was no output, so there's no changes made. So that, that proves that uh, Gen 2 isn't affected by this problem. So I'll become LFS again. For many modern systems with multiple processors or cores, the compilation time for the packages can be reduced by performing a parallel make by telling the make program how many processors are available. 
So as it says that uh, an i9-3900 has uh, 32 cores, logical cores in total, and it would be advisable to obviously build using as many of those cores as possible. So we can run make minus J32, or for example, this machine has got 16 logical cores. Um, alternatively, rather than typing that in every time, we can export the make flags variable and it means that every time make is run it will recognize that make flags has been set and it will use that setting to compile that many jobs and we can make that permanent as it says here by running this command here and it will actually add it to the dot bash rc um, startup file and if we source the bash profile, all these variables should be loaded and activated. So if I do set, we can see if we scroll past all this. Somewhere, right, okay, that's quite a lot. Not sure what all those functions are doing. No doubt they're doing something useful. Right, it's actually scrolled off the screen. So what I'm going to do is to set the scroll back further than I think the default is a thousand lines. It could be useful to set that to infinite. So edit the profile one. Scrolling. Yep, let's set it to unlimited so we don't lose information. Uh, set that OK, OK. Right, in that case, uh, what I'll do, rather than look for them, I'll just echo some of these. So, for example, let's echo make flags to start off with. That's there. And let's echo, uh, for example, LFS target. And you can see that's there as well. So that they've all been activated. And it also means if we log out from LFS and log back in again, you can see those again are still retained those those variables are still retained SBUs um, effectively to summarize what it says here if we time how long it takes the first package to run all the SBUs are based off that so if you subsequently see a package that takes two SBUs it means it takes twice as long as the first package however it's not always that simple um, SBUs are affected by many variables it says there um, oh no sorry that's about if there are errors um, yes affected by many variables how much memory you've got whether the compile actually had to uh, be swapped to disk because it ran out of memory um, the performance of the disk itself whether it was an SSD or a, a spinning hard disk speed of the memory um, I/O latencies, ev everything you can think about will be affecting the SBUs, so they're not very reliable. Even down to I think something I mentioned before, the internal caches on the CPU. If you, <clears throat> for example, timed the compilation of a couple of packages, one did take twice as long as another one on a modern PC. I could almost guarantee if you run it on an older PC, say 10 or 15 years old, that it would take three or four times longer purely because those caches are either reduced in size on, on board the CPU or the off-board caches are smaller. So there's less chance that the um, processing can be accelerated by by caches. Even the set size and so on, it, gets, it can get very technical. Um, so the SBUs must be taken with a pinch of salt. I, I would probably think a better way of using SPUs these days would be to have just three categories um, say long medium and short for example in terms of duration so this package takes a long time to compile i.e. you could expect to wait maybe half an hour or hours for it to complete a medium one where it'd be no more than half an hour say 10 minutes to half an hour and a short one where it's no more than say five minutes something like that I think that would be probably be more more of a a good guide. Um, however, it is what it is. Um, even 
using a an AMD versus an Intel may may produce different results as well, uh, even though the the CPUs are apparently equivalent. It does also say that um, failures uh, can occur uh, when compiling in parallel. Sometimes the uh, dependencies of the packages that or the programs that are compiled doesn't resolve accurately for some reason. Um, and in that case, it's just best, best to rerun the uh, package with one job. Um, and it should run then. And if it still errors, at least you'll see the error straight away rather than, rather than buried in amongst many other jobs that have been running in parallel. Uh, the pre time presented here for all packages except for the first package, which has been utils pass one, which is based on one core, uh, based on using four cores. Um, the times in chapter eight also include the time to run the regression test for packages unless specified otherwise. So, yeah, the, the, see, this gets confusing as well because they've based the SPU for the first package using one core. And then all the remaining packages are based on using four cores. And then the times in chapter eight should also include the time it takes to run the, the tests. Um, so if, for example, binutils ran on, or binutils pass one took, say, 10 minutes, it's saying that a subsequent build would be based on four cores. Um, and therefore it would be 2.5 minutes effectively. Um, and again, it's not always that simple because every package doesn't use all cores all at once. There are There's a lot of time where just one job's running because no other jobs can run at the same time because there are no further parallel dependencies that could run. Um, and that can skew the timings as well. Uh, so, yeah, like I say, take them with a pinch of salt. Just use them as a very rough guide um, and even then question how, how accurate that rough guide is. About the test suites, um, as it says, it's pointless to run the test suites in Chapter 5 and 6. They may run, they may not do, but you won't know whether that's a good thing or not because the host system is still being relied on. It's not until we get to Chapter um, 8, I think it is, where we're building the final system and we're building the fast, final system using tools we've already built ourselves. We're not reliant on the host system uh, that we can start to uh, take some sort of uh, attention or make some sort of, sort of attention to the results of tests and how accurate they are.